So where did my passion come for physical fitness? If I told you it was born in a gym in Newark many years ago, that was an old dusty warehouse gym and the gym was called High Energy, would you believe it? Well, if not, stay tuned. We're gonna tell you a story. Hi everybody, it's Mike from 1614 Fitness and I want to share with you the fact that my passion for fitness was actually born, actually created at High Energy, the gym. A legendary, iconic fixture in the city of Newark for years. It was scary. In fact, if you check out the first episode, I admitted openly that I was terrified. I was so afraid to go in the first time because I saw all these muscle-bound guys and a dog standing out the front door. I panicked. I told my buddy Tommy, I could, dude, I can't do it. I went home and worked out in my basement for a month and a half so I could muster up enough confidence so I could go in there. And then once I went in there, it was beautiful. It was wonderful. Friendships, tra it was just great. I would go there every single day. When I got a big boy job, I went there afterwards. While I had a little boy job, I went there before. And the friends and the people and the characters that I met there man, I could write a book. Nobody would buy it, but boy, I could fill it easily. So I gotta thank Stacy and Chris. You guys built something to change my life. That moment when Tommy asked me to come to High Energy, it was a game changer for me. It was a big time game changer because it would change not only my life, but ultimately it would change the lives of countless other people. Because 1614 Fitness would not be created had it not been for High Energy. Relationships, babies, businesses would have never happened. The first episode, we talked about the butterfly effect. And we talked about how some small, seemingly inconsequential actions can change the course of history. Well, Tommy did it. Tommy called me on a regular phone, as antiquated as that sounds, with a cord, by the way, which is really antiquated, and invites me to a gym. I say, sure, too intimidated, I go back, but we ended up going to the gym and going there together. That moment, that phone call, that hesitation, that go back, changed the course of my life. Not only mine, but babies were born, relationships were made, businesses were made, and friendships have been made and kept ever since. So that one phone call, that one occurrence changed the course of my life, and it changed the course of countless others. So Tommy, I appreciate it. But High Energy Gym and the energy and what I saw there every day, I saw people go there and as soon as they walked in, they were happy. There was a weird magic about people wanting to be there. And I knew one day I wanted to create the same thing. Because what a great piece of magic. You know, it was like, that was like a little weightlifting uh, Disney World. People would come in and would just have fun. And if if I could be lucky enough to do that, just make it that big compared to what they did, I would be so excited. So that's when it was born. I had a big time direction. See, because I talked about in the first episode where I didn't have direction and that lack of direction got me relocated from the University of Delaware. Well, relocation no, means that I was ousted. I had direction in high school. For the first time in my life, I didn't. I got myself back in Dell Tech. I realized I wanted to work in radio, so I found a job. But because of high energy, I found a passion. That passion and that job I thought would marry perfectly. Here's how I saw it working out. I was gonna go to college, get my degree, work in radio. I was gonna be a morning guy, afternoon guy, nighttime guy, I didn't care. I was gonna be on the radio. I was gonna enjoy it, and I was gonna accumulate a little bit of local fame. Not much, a little. And then 10 years afterwards, I would parlay that into a little small gym in my hometown. That was my goal. That was what I wanted to do. And I could see it all working. I had direction. My first concrete goal had been set. I was in. Everything I needed was right there. All I needed to do was figure out how to make it happen. So I find myself at Dell Tech. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, I got to get out of the two-year program and get into a four-year program. So I start looking. Wilmington University, a long time ago, used to be Wilmington College. And before it had the big student center, the, the big campus, and the, those wonderful buildings, we were in little tiny trailers, and we were on Route 13. But they had a great communications program. It was a four-year school, and I'm like, this is it. This is where I'm going. 
It's a four year deal. So I'm like, all right, when does it start? It started perfectly in terms of when Dell Tech was gonna end. I was set. I took a look at the prices. I said, oh, we got ourselves a problem. See, because in the first episode, you heard very clearly that my dad said, no, no, dude, you got relocated. I was gonna pay for the first, I ain't paying for this one. So paying for college was on me. A blessing in disguise, yeah. Because when I was writing a check to Dell Tech, or, uh, Dell Tech, man, I studied. And I studied hard and I got A's. All right, so now I gotta go to Wilmington, which was considerably more expensive. I didn't realize that Wilmington College was a private institution, which means fancy, it's just more expensive. All right, Houston, we've got a problem. What am I gonna do? Because I, I had enough money accumulated where I could pay for the first semester, but that's it. I had not a penny left. My dad taught me the ability to budget. I had money set up. Once I wrote that check for my first full semester, at Wilmington, which I had to do, by the way, because my dad's insurance program, if I wasn't a full-time student, I wasn't covered in any sort of insurance program. So I needed to get four classes, and I had just enough money for four classes. So I enroll at Wilmington University, Wilmington College at the time. So I had been a couple, I guess a year removed, or a couple years removed from baseball, so I'm like, you know what, let me see if I can get a scholarship. I felt the old kid could still play some baseball, so I set up an appointment. We have a meeting, we go over this, we talk this, and they knew who I was, and I knew who they were. We're talking scholarship, and they said, listen, we'll give you partial, but we can't give you any more than that. We can find money through, through you know, all these programs they can do. We can do something, but we can't do it all. So I figured, well, if they can do part, that means I have no money, I won't be able to work because I'm gonna be playing ball all the time. From a budget perspective, that just didn't work. And was I gonna go into play pro ball? Dude, I couldn't throw and I couldn't hit a curveball. So this was a waste, I was done. I officially retired from baseball that day. I needed a job. Stay tuned for another butterfly effect because it's coming. So anyway, I needed a job, but I know I needed to go to school. So I go to uh, Wilmington University, Wilmington College on a total whim. I have enough money for one semester. So I go, I'm taking all my intro courses. I got those few courses that would transfer. I'm going okay. I have no idea how I'm gonna pay for the next semester, but everything's okay. So one day, I'm at high energy, my home away from home, working out. A dude who I've seen in the gym, but didn't know. I didn't know who he was, I didn't talk with him, we didn't hang out, we didn't even lift. Friendly enough, I just didn't know him. Out of nowhere, he comes up to me and goes, hey man, do you work with kids? I go, what do you mean? No, I, I work at a video store. He goes, I saw you in the paper, and you were working with a special needs child. I go, when did you see me in the paper? He goes, I saw you on the front page of the sports. You were sitting, you were wearing a football helmet and, or sitting on a football helmet and you were talking to about a girl, a uh, blue goal game. I go, my gosh, that was years ago. Oh yeah, we were doing a project to work and we had these old newspapers out and I, I saw your picture and I thought, I know this guy from the gym. I says, well, no, I, I don't. I worked with her. See, for those of you who don't live in Delaware, the blue goal game, it's a big deal. And it's a great big deal, meaning it's a great project. They take seniors from the various uh, high school teams and, and play a game. The football game is the biggest. You get the North guys, the South guys, and it's a two-week program. You go to the dorm, you live, you practice, you play. But throughout that two-week program, you are connected with a buddy. One of the athletes from Special Olympics. You go and do events with that person. And it's an awesome event. All the money that's made from this football game goes to Special Olympics. I had the opportunity to establish a relationship with an athlete from Special Olympics. And they took a picture of us, they wrote a big story about us because I was the first to do it for my school. So I said, well, yeah, I had a great time and I felt very comfortable with her, but why do you ask? He says, well, listen, I work for the state of Delaware and we are in need of people to work in this job. I said, well, what is it? He says, well, it's for the Department of Sto uh, the State of Delaware Department of Child Mental Health. It took me a second. Department of Child Mental Health. It's no longer in existence. They divided it all up and renamed it. But that's what it was. They worked with abused children. The home that he worked out of was located in Middletown. He says, listen, we need part-time help and we need it desperately. And if you're comfortable working in that environment, you might be a good fit. Well, I needed a job and I had to believe that that job would pay better, would have better opportunities than my video job. So I took him up on it. I took the interview, I went through the whole process, I took a tour of the facility, and we hit it off. Everything was fine. And talk about a life changer. 
talk about a butterfly effect. Think about that for a second. Let's call this gentleman Dan. Dan is at the facility working on some art project and they would collect the newspapers because they would use them for paper mache or whatever they would use them for. He pulls out a box that's two, three years old, sees a picture of a guy. He could have easily not paid attention. He could have easily said, I think I know that guy and used it. He could have easily said, I think I know that guy. He's probably an idiot. I don't want to talk to him, but he didn't. He took a look at that guy and goes, I know that guy at the gym. He's working with a, a, a person from Special Olympics. Huh? What if he wants to work here? Think about the odds of that happening. Talk about a butterfly effect. And chances are he could have not even got that box. Somebody else could have got it. Long story short, it was a huge game changer for me in my life. I gave my two weeks at the video store. I started working at the state of Delaware, Department of Child and Mental Health. I was what they called a permanent part-time employee, which meant I was just on the extra list and they would use me whenever they could. It worked out fine. I was making more money working less than I was before. It gave me more time to study and more time to go to high energy. So it was perfect. And I actually liked the job a lot. And quite frankly, if you ask me where I gained my knowledge in life, I would tell you the seven years I spent there is where I learned to multitask. It's where I learned a ton of street smarts. It's where I learned how to observe and how to lead and how to understand the world in a bigger picture because these people, these young people were going through some stuff that I couldn't fathom. Talk about writing a book. I could write a book there. This was a 12 bed facility. At the time there was men, boys and girls, which is a tremendously unique energy there. Uh, most of which 90 plus percent were sexually abused. So these young people had challenges, had immense challenges. So one of my very first days, I got to tell you, I could do a six hour story on just this facility alone, but keep in mind, so I walk in there and I'm 19-ish, something like that, 19 and a half years old. The residents, some of them were 17, 18 years old, so it was kind of a unique dynamic. And one of the great stories I love to share is that uh, we'll call him Herman. Herman, I didn't interview with for some reason. There was two uh, counselors on staff, the director and the second shift supervisor, who was Herman. I didn't interview with him for some reason. He was out on training. My first week, he was on vacation. So I didn't know this individual. And the children, the kids at this program would mention, oh, you've never met Herman? Ooh, watch yourself, he's a tough one. I'm like, who's this Herman guy? This guy's something. But whenever the kids would act up, they would mention Herman, everybody would settle down. Herman was in charge, all right? So I'm just being me. Gosh knows what I look like. I could have had white hair in a bun, I, I don't know. Could have had, I don't know what I look like, but it was probably a mess, and I probably spoke fluent beach at the time. So Herman, who is a black dude, and is 10 years my senior, his first day was Tuesday, I guess my sixth day there. And he looks at me, and I look at him, and I grin, and I man said, hey baby, my name's Mike. And he put his head down. It was like, who is this child and why is he working on my shift? He openly did not like me. He did everything in his power to make me quit. Everything, every task, every job, any undesirable thing that had to be done, it was this guy who was doing it. I knew he hated me. I didn't know why he hated me, but he hated me. Come to find out, he looked at me as just a live wire. He's like, this guy is volatile and he's not going to be good for what we're doing. But the crazy thing about it is, he is my longest running friend. I met him when I said, what did I say, 18 and a half, 19 years old? I'm almost 50 and I see him and talk to him all the time. As time went on, I became his right hand man. As time went on, I became the guy who covered for him when he wasn't on call. As time went on and he moved on, I took his position. So Herman, God bless you brother, you taught me a load. And I'm about to share with you the biggest lesson that he taught me, and he did it within the first month. So thank you, Herman. But that being said, we were a facility that uh, incorporated passive restraint. There were times when our residents would become out of control. And our philosophy was simple. We are not going to allow you to hurt anyone else. We're not going to allow you to hurt yourself. We're not going to allow you to hurt the state property. And we're not going to allow you to hurt me or my staff. So we were taught ways to physically restrain folks. Ironically enough, I became the person down the road to would facilitate these classes. But in the beginning, I was a rookie. I knew nothing. So I remember the first two or three weeks I was there, 
something was getting shaky and this young man needed to get restrained and I was first man there. It was the most ugly dance one could ever imagine. It was here, there, 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 sweat. I was going crazy and finally I get him down. My heart is pounding like this. <laughs> He's sweating, I'm sweating and everybody's looking at me. I got him on the ground. He's safe, I'm safe but I'm about to have a nervous breakdown. Because when somebody is out of control, your heart starts to pump. I was, okay, I'm good. Herman walks up to me, calm as a cucumber, and he says, baby, you're good. I got him. Get up with yourself. Calm yourself down. And I'm like, yes, yeah, I'm good. Just and watch him. He's going to twist on you, Herman. Not good. So we finally get him restrained. Everything's good. I'm sweating. My shirt's untucked. My hair's going all over here. And he looked at me calm as a cucumber and says, baby, the next time you restrain somebody, I need you to do one thing and I need you to do it perfectly. You've got to be the calmest guy in the room. What? How in the name of God do you want me to wrestle a kid that's darn near bigger than me and you want me to be calm? He says, listen, you can't put your hands on somebody if you're not in control. You could hurt them. You could hurt you. You could cause a mess. You need to be in complete control of yourself before you have any hopes of controlling somebody else. And I remember almost hyperventilating, thinking, this man is crazy. I was out of my mind. I truly went home thinking, dude, there is no way I could possibly physically grab, restrain safely without myself getting all ramped up. Irony will play a role in this part of the program. As time went on, I remember I became I became not only the, a full-timer, but I ended up being, we'll talk about that in a second, but I became the second shift supervisor. I took over Herman's role. I remember hearing a resident scream craziness that he was gonna do some terrible bodily damage to my manager. And I waited. And then my manager thought the best way to control this opportunity was to scream louder and more violently than the child did. So he screams even louder which of course causes the resident to, well, the only thing I can do is really go nuts. He screams and throws something. I realize it's time to gain control of the situation. I walked in the room, I put my arm around the manager's baby, just go have a seat, you'll be good. And I said, come here, child. I got him settled down. Oh man, it was like turning back a clock. I looked at this guy, he's like, did you hear what he said to me? He threw the book at me and he was cussing. I said, yeah, I did. So here's what I got out of that. So at 8.59, I've got one crazy child. At 9.01, I've got one crazy child and one crazy staff member. I have doubled my craziness in 60 seconds. This is bad. I gawked out of the hallway. I said, come here, come on. I put my arm around my staff member. I said, just, just sit down, just please sit down. I got this, everything's fine. And I calmed the child down. And then it was as if I went back in time. I said, Bob, what are you doing? I can't have two crazy people. I, I already had one. I can't double it. I've become Herman. It's all happened. What I thought I could never do, I'm now in charge of helping others do. And come to think of it, that would play a big role in my fitness world, wouldn't it? But that job taught me a ton. So let me go back a little bit. So I'm a permanent part-time guy. I'd work a couple shifts a night, four to 12, which worked out perfectly because my class schedule, I could work around it. It worked out wonderfully. And then about uh, four or five months into it, they promote me. I become permanent part-time. I become a permanent part-time B, which means I've got tenure, I can stay. I'm not on the extra list, I'm on the schedule. Every month I know when I'm working. This is good, A, B, whatever they call me, but that was me, I was in. And I'm getting good grades and things are okay, but I'm really running short on money. Money's not good. I had accumulated a little bit because I'm making more and I could get more shifts, I took any shift I could. But I knew that I was in trouble because I was trending not good. My grades were still good, everything was good, but money, not so good. About that time, one of the guys we worked with got hired. He got hired as a state police officer and there was an opening. I never thought about it. I never thought about it at all. They approached me and said, hey Mike, you interested in being permanent? I go, permanent, what do you mean? Are you interested in being full time? I go, full time, well, I don't know. And I remember thinking, I don't know if I can do that. But then I thought about it 
If I do that, that solves my financial troubles. I went years and years without buying myself clothes or fast food. People think I was a health nut then, it's just I couldn't afford it. I had enough money for books in school and that was it, and gas. I said, wait a minute, if I'm full time, and I realized I can do this, I can go full time, work full time, school full time, pay my bills, and everything will be okay. I'm certainly not gonna graduate in four years, but I can at least make this happen. I accepted that position, and I was busy. I didn't have time to go play. I didn't have time to live what we're gonna call the standard college life. I worked full time. But another thing I got, I got benefits. I got vacation, I got sick days. I'm here now all of a sudden I'm cranking 20, 21 years old. I'm cranking like, you know what? I'm kind of a big boy. I've come a long way since that day I resigned from the job after one day. That changed my world. But I've come a long way. We were able to pull ourselves up from the bootstraps and move past that. So I'm working full time at the state of Delaware, earning benefits, my own insurance. I'm getting uh, uh, holiday time, vacation time, calm time, and more importantly, dude, I'm paying for college. I've got a goal, I've got direction, I've got a major, and I can pay the bills. Talk about feeling better about yourself. I gotta think, when I resigned from that job, personally, I was at a low, uh, the biggest low that I can think of, and it was a steady climb up after that. That moment, it was a pretty good feeling. That was a high, because I felt like I could take care of my own business, and I was proud of that. So, we're moving on. Life is good. And I thought that I'd seen all the crazy changes in my life. I thought high energy, crazy change. State of Delaware, crazy change. Getting kicked out of school, crazy change. Can I rewind for a second? Here's a fun story. I get relocated from the University of Delaware. The gentleman who kicked me out becomes a client of mine at, at 1614 Fitness. Six, seven months into his membership, I see him in the locker room. I go, hey doc, can I tell you a funny story? He goes, yeah, Mike, what's up? I go, you wrote me a letter around 10, 15 years ago. He says, no. I said, oh yeah. He looked at me without even blinking and says, well, I guess it all worked out for you, didn't it? And doc, I guess so far so good. All right, let's come back in present time. So I'm, I'm working for the state and life is good. I'm paying my bills, I'm getting good grades. And then I get promoted to um, what they call an activity director. And that made me feel good, I'm a director. And not only am I a director, but I got my own grease board. I get like this big fancy pantsy grease board that everybody pays attention to. Oh, I'm big stuff. I'm big time guys, big time. So my job was to come up with activities come up with activities that were conducive for our behavior modification program, that were conducive to our budget, which was no budget, um, conducive to the restrictions that our residents had. We had a Tuesday night level three trip. Every Tuesday we had a level three trip. And what we would do is we would take the residents who earned level three, three days in a row. They would earn points and in turn earn levels that would give them different uh, benefits. Everybody wanted to be level three because you got more of this, you got more of that, and ultimately you could go on level three trips. So I did those and I come up with weekend activities. And then, butterfly effect. It's a warning because we got a big one coming. One would come that would change my life, change my life forever. And if you thought I had craziness before, well, let's just say this is going to change my life more than ever. So let's just say I find a flyer of an activity. And I call the man who runs this activity. I say, listen, I have 12 children. I would love to get free tickets to one of your events. But if you can only give me eight, six, whatever you can give me, it would be great. But I know they would love it. But I gotta make sure, is this a family friendly activity? Oh, absolutely. Here's what I'll do, sir, talking to me. I'll give you eight tickets. Eight tickets every time we have an event, we'll call it, wink, wink. I said, great. I can take two staff, which means at six extra tickets, we can take six residents. There's 12 beds, 12 residents, so what we can do is this. We'll take the two weeks prior to the event, whichever six residents earns the most points, will get to go with me and another staff member to this event. And wow, what a success that was for the behavior modification of our residency, but what a storybook freak show of a change it would cause in my life. You want to know what that is, probably. And I want to share it with you. And we'll talk about whatever that crazy event was at the next episode. You got to tune in. Hey, I'll see you at the gym.